My daughters were born here in Georgia. My wife and I adopted them when they were three months old. And so bringing them back here to experience their country. Oh, look, he's waving. He's waving. He just stopped to wave. And then to meet and spend time with their birth families for me is a very special experience. My father was uh, Dr. William Pierce. He was considered the most dangerous and influential white supremacist or neo-Nazi in North America for over a 30-year period. He was physically and emotionally abusive from the time I was probably two years old. And he was also the author of the book, The Turner Diaries, where a white nationalist overthrow of the US government happened. There were a lot of parallels between that book and what happened in the United States on January 6th. Hate is a disease. You know, hate is a mental disease. It's, it's the product of a deluded mind. And I would offer that there's an alternative. There's a different choice that you can make. We all have the choice. This is the Javari Monastery. So Javari is the word, the Georgian word for cross. Kelvin Pierce has traveled from his home in the United States to the South Caucasus nation of Georgia. I love to walk up. It's uh, a little steep in places, <laughs> but it's uh, exhilarating. Kelvin is here with his two adopted daughters, Marayame and Marika. They were both born in Georgia three days apart in December 1995 to two different mothers. They have returned to reconnect with each of their biological families and learn more about their Georgian heritage. Inside of here, they have like a secret stairwell that goes all the way down to the river. For Kelvin, this is a journey of healing, and for his daughters, a journey of discovery. It was really surreal coming to Georgia in the first place and being around so many people that look like you. That was mind-blowing to me. It's just opened my eyes, uh, I think, a little bit more. And I'm more grateful for what I have. At an outdoor market in the capital, Tbilisi, Kelvin and his daughters make a stop before visiting Marika's birth family. Mm -hmm. Ati Kilo. With some help from friends Gil Julian and Lika Merevishvili, they buy food in bulk. Lika, I need a translation of long rice and round rice. They will deliver it all to Marika's birth family, who live in a village on the outskirts of the capital. We get beans and rice and pasta and flour and sugar and salt and yeast. Um, and it's basically, you know, the, the subsistence type food that they need. With the car loaded up, they hit the road for the drive to the village of Serovani. It's the third time Marika will be meeting her biological mother and siblings. She has learned she has a half-brother, Omar, who helps unload the food. It's always exciting and they're always really excited to see me. And I like bringing them food and presents and it's just nice to be able to spend time with them. Just trying to imagine myself living in like this and in these conditions, and it's really always hard to imagine myself doing that. It makes me extra grateful coming here because I know what I could have ended up living like. Marika Pierce was first reunited with her biological mother in 2013 when she took her first trip back to Georgia at age 17. Through birth records, Kelvin had found the family and befriended them. After earning their trust over a couple of years, he was ready to reveal the truth. So we decided that we were going to tell the grandmother. She was obviously the matriarch of the family. and You could tell just from the dynamics that she basically ran that family. And my translator was like, you know, does such and such date, you know, 
is that a memory of yours? And she got this weirdest look on her face. And she was just like, no. And when my translator was like, are you sure? And then she just like turned and then she looked at me and she like, we made eye contact and I was just smiling at her. And all of a sudden she just like broke into this big smile. And then she turned to my translator and said, yes. And she goes, oh my gosh. And she's like, that's her. And she goes, I've always wondered what happened to that girl. I've always wondered what happened to that girl. The grandmother then told Marika's birth mother that the daughter she had abandoned had returned. And she immediately busted out into tears and she ran off into the woods. And she disappeared for like a long time. And then all of a sudden she just reappeared. And she went up to my translator and said, can I see Marika alone in the house? And I went to Marika, you know, she was just, you know, a young kid. I said, do you want me to come in with you? And she goes, no, dad, I've got this. And she went in there and she, when she came back out, she said the first thing she did was she grabbed me and started kissing me all over my face and all over my chest. And um, yeah, that was quite a dramatic experience. The language barrier can be a challenge, but after three visits, Marika is slowly building a bond with her birth mother. She looked a lot like me, and so did my little sister look, I think, identical to me. So that was really cool to see. But she, I think, is shy. They're, very, they're all really shy. Mariemi Pierce is also spending time with her birth mother. It's their second meeting and the first time they've been together in eight years. It's like you're getting to know someone. You know, usually like you get to know someone and then you build a relationship with them. It's like we already have this inherent relationship and you know that there's love there, but you don't know them as a person. So it's a very unique experience. <laughs> Mariami and her birth mother gather at a restaurant with Kelvin and the others to sample some Georgian cuisine. It's been so fascinating to learn how similar we are. I was surprisingly shocked at how much I felt we didn't look alike, but I could pick up on mannerisms right away that I was just like, oh my gosh. So it, it kind of was just as much about the body language and the energy as it was the looks. Mariami had her first reunion with her birth mother in 2013. As with Marika's biological family, Kelvin found Mariami's birth mother, befriended her, and built a relationship. But when he revealed that Mariami was her birth daughter, her reaction wasn't initially positive. When we told her, she went catatonic for like 10 minutes. She just hung her head down and stared at the floor for 10 minutes and wouldn't talk to us. And finally, when she started talking, she was, her first reaction was, I never wanted to hear about this child ever again for the rest of my life. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me. I never wanted to hear about her. But after having a few hours to get over the shock, Mariami's birth mother had a change of heart. And that night she called my translator and said, I want to see her again. I want to see her tomorrow. And I'm sorry for the way I reacted. And so we met at a restaurant the next day and she came with a family album of pictures of what it was like when she grew up as a kid. Now, every single year on her birthday, she calls. Every time I visit her, she asks for more pictures of Mariami. Her apartment walls are covered with pictures of her daughter. You know, it took a while, but it turned out to be a good thing. <laughs> Mariami and Marika's adoptive mother, Susan Pierce, couldn't make this trip. She stayed in the United States to keep the family's home remodeling business running but she's with her daughters in spirit. So this is a locket with um, me and my sister. It was my mom's and she gave it to me um, about six months ago. When Mariami and Marika were born, Georgia was going through a crippling economic and energy crisis. Electricity and water were scarce in the years following independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. Corruption was rampant and conditions in orphanages were often dire. Kelvin and Susan Pierce were among the first couples to apply for an international adoption from Georgia. 
when I saw my daughters for the first time. Yeah, it was extremely emotional for me. When they brought those girls in, you know, there was no heat in the hospitals and they were all swaddled up in these blankets. It's like they brought in these wrapped up packages and then they laid them on a table and then unwrapped them. And I saw them for the first time. I, yeah, I was transformed. It was just like, I, I became a different person. It was like, I am their father now and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make sure this adoption goes through. As a younger man, however, Calvin couldn't fathom becoming a parent, let alone having his own biological children. I was terrified of the idea of propagating my genes. I had no idea why my dad was such a terrible father, and he treated us awful. Lots and lots and lots of beatings, uh, lots of really just rejection. <clears throat> so I was just like, there's just no way that I'm gonna take the chance that A, I would be a father like him, and B, that I would create other children that would feel the way I do. Any lingering doubts Calvin may still have had about fatherhood quickly disappeared as he and his wife raised their daughters in the U.S. state of Virginia. He wrote a letter to his estranged father informing him about the adoption. There was no reaction at all. And I was just like thinking about it. I was like, it's because they're not white enough for him. That's why he didn't respond. That's why he doesn't acknowledge them. Calvin's father, William Pierce, was the founder and leader of an influential white supremacist group in the United States called the National Alliance. To the neighborhood kids, my name wasn't Calvin, it was Nazi. And so we got beat up a lot. Calvin and his brother were raised to follow their father's racist and hateful ideology. You know, I remember as a young kid, uh, you know, looking at black kids in my class and wondering about it and like wondering like, what is it like to be black and to feel subhuman like they must because my dad said they were not humans, they were subhuman, they were more like animals. And I believed it. And I would look at my skin and I would be like, oh, I'm so grateful that I'm white and that I don't have their condition. And yeah, and I was, I was kind of amazed, I was curious, but I was also afraid. It was only when Calvin left for university that he began to question his father's racist doctrine and form his own views about the world. By the time I left home when I was 18 years old, I was severely damaged. I hated myself and I hated a lot of other people. You know, I believed everything that my dad taught me about Jews and blacks and um, you know, other races and how they were responsible for so many ills of our society. But, you know, I soon started learning differently. You know, when I started meeting people from all over the world, you know, one of my first roommates in college was a, a South American man. And I really liked this guy and I thought he was really intelligent. I thought he was, you know, a thoughtful, empathetic individual. And um, I learned a lot of things that my dad had taught me was wrong. By the time Calvin was in university, his father had deserted the family and permanently relocated to a sprawling compound where he recruited followers and took on a series of other wives. Under an alias, he wrote and published an influential book in 1978 called The Turner Diaries. The ultra-violent race war novel was dubbed the Bible of the racist right by the FBI. Well, the vision that he was promoting was a white ethno state, and he believed that uh, racial or ethnic cleansing was the way to get there. And so the book was, in a sense, a, a blueprint for what that would look like, what, you know, what it would look like if it actually happened. It talked a lot about, you know, hanging Jews and blacks and interracial couples from the city streets on light poles. It talked about a bombing of a federal building that was almost identical to the bombing that Timothy McVeigh carried out in Oklahoma City in 1995. About a third, about a third of the building has been blown away. And you can see this smoke and debris and fire on the ground. As a matter of fact, Timothy McVeigh uh, admitted that the Turner Diaries was his motivation for the bombing of Oklahoma City Federal Building. 
More than 160 people were killed in what was the deadliest terrorist attack on U.S. soil before 9-11. Timothy McVeigh was convicted and executed. And the FBI actually found a copy of the book in the car he was driving the day of the bombing. The Turner Diaries also described a violent attack on the U.S. Capitol buildings, the overthrow of the U.S. government. There's also, you know, the day of the rope. And the hanging of lawmakers. So there were a lot of parallels between that book and what happened in the United States on January 6th. The attempted uh, insurrection on our, our government. They broke the glass. Everybody stay down, get down. Many of the things that happened that day on the Capitol were seen as uh, evoking the book. So there was the sort of gallows scene out in front of the Capitol and there was a hanging noose there. And many people said that that was sort of um, referencing the, the, the day of the rope in the book. Of the 800 people that made it into the Capitol, we don't yet know how many of them, if any of them, actually read the Turner Diaries. But I do think what you see in the Turner Diaries is something very similar to what you see that happened that day. And there are these sort of consistent themes on the far right. And then the other thing that's just so eerily similar is the idea that the only way you're going to get what you want as a white nationalist is through violence. So it's very anti-democratic. Calvin's father died in 2002, almost two decades before the attempted insurrection at the Capitol. And to be honest, I was like, I'm so glad my dad's not alive now and that my dad isn't like trying to be a leader of, of this because I felt personally that the only reason that the attack on the Capitol didn't get any worse than it was is because they never really had a unified leader. It was kind of a bunch of factions that came together, but if they had had a really good, charismatic leader, like my dad was during the National Alliance, it could have gone a lot worse. As political rhetoric in the United States became increasingly extreme and polarized following the 2016 U.S. presidential vote, Calvin decided he needed to speak out about white supremacy and his painful childhood. He published a book in 2020. Sins of my father, growing up with America's most dangerous white supremacist. While I was writing that book, especially writing about my experiences with my dad, that it was a very cathartic, very healing experience for me. The road to recovery from his painful youth has been a long one for Calvin. But his experience has also allowed him to help others who have suffered childhood trauma. I'm so happy to see the sun. He and his daughters are on their way to an orphanage in the Georgian village of Tsilkani. We got the greatest gift of our lives from Georgia, you know, our two daughters, and we should do something to help these kids. How you doing? Hi. Good luck, huh? Good to see you. This is one of four children's homes run by a charity Kelvin established in 2007, the Divine Child Foundation. So the kids here, um, you know, they range in age from, you know, about eight years old up to 18. You know, when they're 18, they graduate out of the system. About 10 children live in each of the homes with caregivers. The idea is to create an intimate family-like setting. Ask him if he still has his, what, Superman Mayasori? Kelvin visits about twice a year and has made around 30 trips to Georgia since establishing the foundation. It has allowed him to get to know the children personally and learn some Georgian. Pekburti? Yes? Yes. A significant part of the budget for the children's homes comes from donations Kelvin raises in the United States. Over the years, he's also given tens of thousands of dollars of his own money. The Georgian government helps cover some of the costs. The manager of the Divine Child Foundation in Georgia, Lali Tsertsvadze, contacts local businesses asking for donations of food. She's also a child psychologist who is trained to deal with issues orphan children can have. 
ოჯახისგან, შობლებისგან, ბავშვები რომლებიც არიან სოციო ეკონომიკური უსახკარო ობოლი ბავშვები, ყოველს ბავშვები ხდებიან ჩვენთან. The homes work on building life skills that the children will need to find jobs and become independent. But rebuilding trust is one of the biggest hurdles. Bavshevs romelsets ara akt mijaqoloba, bavshevs romelsets daingrat tsxoreba, mat ara vinar uqart, kho, mat bevrjer atqines, daazianes. Aseti bavshevistvis tsnelia, aseti bavshevs zalian tsnelia, atsveno rom giqarts amas dro unda, mijaqoloba unda chamoqalibdes am bavshevis ntoba unda movibot. They are all issues that Kelvin has some understanding of from his own difficult upbringing. They would look at you with suspicion. They would scowl at you. They don't feel wanted by their parents. They don't feel loved by anybody. And so I made a decision then that I was going to do whatever I could to break through to these kids. So I just kept smiling at them, making eye contact, and one by one those barriers came down. Good job. Over a game of soccer, Marika and Mariami get to know some of the kids at the home. Handball! It's also a chance for them to get another taste of Georgian culture and language. Karaoke. 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 Hmm. Like apple, but citrusy, maybe? Kurdzeni. 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 Some grapes. Kurdzeni. How do you make that with yours? <laughs> Kelvin's frequent visits to Georgia to work with the children's homes made it easier for him to track down his daughter's birth mothers and connect them to their roots. You know, the idea really started with I wanted to try to create some sort of physical link between my daughters and their birth country. Back in Tbilisi, Kelvin and his daughters visit a divine child home in the district of Didi Digomi. Hello. Oh, that's a big smile. Yes. Come here, Joppa. It's a newer facility for severely physically and mentally disabled children. You know, it was such a traumatic thing for the parents when, you know, their child was born with these severe disabilities. And some of the parents didn't feel like they had the resources to, to deal with it. Sometimes a family is able to take their child back if their financial situation improves. And there is a talk uh, that um, parents may take uh, him. Uh, oh, that would be uh, fantastic. Yeah, kind of wow. Like Gil Julian is also one of the founders of the Divine Child Foundation in Georgia and has invested substantial amounts of his own money to make sure the children's homes stay in working order. So the water problem is all the way around the wall. With his technical background, Gil tackles any issues that arise. I'm pretty sure that this is not a plumbing issue. So it's a surface. But rather a, a yes. envir room environment issue. Gil was instrumental in renovating the first orphanage that Divine Child took over in the town of Saguramo in 2007 that was home to about 40 children. It was an abandoned Soviet uh, 1960s high school. They were living in kind of dormitories and they were awful. Uh, they were worse than awful actually. And we put in a new heating system and new walls and a new roof and new doors and windows. Two orphan sisters, Nino and Marisa, spent part of their childhoods growing up in the Sagoramo home. Today, the sisters are both going to university. Nino is studying business and marketing and is grateful to Kelvin and Gil. <laughs> Marisa is studying theology and hopes to be a lecturer and to do charity work. The Georgian government has agreed to pay university tuitions for Nino and Marisa and any other teenager from the children's homes as long as they can pass their entrance exams. But if they don't get into university, the orphans are on their own once they're legally considered adults.
basically here in Georgia, once the kids reach age 18 or they graduate from high school, they're no longer supported and they basically have to leave. And so Gil and I immediately made a decision that we're not gonna let these kids fall through the cracks. So half of our work, if not more than that, is helping the graduates and getting them you know, situated to where they can take care of themselves. Back on the streets of the Georgian capital, Marayami and Marika Pierce turn their attention to some of the stray cats and dogs that roam Tbilisi. It's like really sad to see the strays because they have fleas and they're malnourished and like don't have a home and sometimes they're not treated very nicely. Looks like you've uh, attracted a crowd. Quick, they're coming. <laughs> Marika is interested in learning more about animal rights groups in Georgia. And see how I can help more than just give a few stray cats and dogs some, like, food. After more than a week in Georgia, Marika and Mariami prepare to return to their lives in the United States, grateful for another opportunity to get closer to their biological roots. And it's just really comforting to know that there are people you know, halfway across the world that love you. That's really special. And Mariemi says the trip has also given her other insights. I always like was so fascinated with genetics and also like nature versus nurture and having this unique experience enforces for me that we all have our own identity. You know, who we are raised with and who our family is and our background. It can tell a story of the past, but it doesn't tell a story of the future. That's where you take your power back, where you really stand for something that you believe in. Kelvin Pierce plans to be back in Georgia again soon to continue his work with the orphans at the children's homes. He's thankful to have found a different path from his father's. It would have been so easy for me to live a life of hate just like he did. When you hate other people, you're in essence, you're hating yourself. I think probably the most significant thing for me is the amount of healing that I have in, uh, you know, encountered personally as a result of dealing with these kids. You like? Whoa. And so we can choose to hate the other or we can choose to love the other. <laughs>